I know I said this in the last documentary video too, but when I originally started researching for this video, I was planning to just make a short video like I did with the Laughing Records trend. But after getting into it, I was shocked at how intense it got. So before you start thinking the crossword puzzle craze couldn't have been anything but boring, please keep watching, and I guarantee that the craze was crazier than you thought. The script for this video just kept getting longer and longer, and eventually turned into a much longer video than I had expected. But that's good for me, and I hope it'll be good for you too. So, let's get into it. For many people around my age, crossword puzzles are kind of a relic from our parents' and grandparents' generation. But the fact that they remained strong for so many decades speaks to their wide appeal. While they existed in some form before the 1920s, the reason for why they were in virtually every newspaper for so long was due in large part to the short but intense crossword puzzle craze of the mid-1920s. The origin of the modern crossword puzzle, which was originally called a word cross, can be found in the publication FUN, all capital letters, which was a supplement to the New York world in the previous decade. Created by the section editor Arthur Wynne, they proved very popular, and they continued to be printed. While this version of a crossword puzzle looked a bit different, by the time the crossword craze exploded throughout America, it looked a little bit more familiar, but still not the same. In 1921, a woman named Margaret Petherbridge was hired at the New York World, and was then transferred to Arthur Wynne to help with crosswords. She led the charge toward more uniform standards, and made doubly sure that there were no mistakes and she also began making her own crosswords, which were even more popular. But 1924 would prove to be the watershed year for crossword puzzles. On April 10th, 1924, the fledgling publishing house Simon & Schuster published a book of crosswords. In fact, it was their very first publication. According to one story, Richard Simon's aunt was very fond of crosswords, and it was because of her that the book was published. They also enlisted the help of Margaret Petherbridge in actually making the crosswords for the book. It wasn't expected to be a hit, and only 3,600 copies were printed in the first run. But to their surprise, those copies were sold out in a matter of days, so additional printings were made, and according to some online articles, eventually reached 100,000 copies sold. Although I also found a blurb in the New York Times from December 28, 1924, saying that the publishers reported 444,843 copies sold by December 19th. Whatever the exact number is, what is clear is that it was a big seller. But that demand was largely just in New York City, where the publishing house was located. The group of crossword enthusiasts might have been somewhat modest in number, but they were very dedicated and it wouldn't be long before their enthusiasm became extremely infectious, leading many to label the phenomenon an epidemic. With such a rapidly increasing demand, Simon & Schuster did the only smart thing. They followed up with further crossword books in rapid succession, and others followed suit. Honestly, I think that these 1920s versions of crossword puzzles look cooler from a design perspective, and I would argue that the design of this version of crosswords was a big reason why the craze was able to seep into society in almost every conceivable way. And throughout this video, you'll see a bunch of illustrations and pictures that show how they were used. Crosswords quickly overshadowed the previous Mahjong craze, and the November 15th, 1924 and January 10th, 1925 issues of the satirical magazine Judge were dedicated to them, stating its own opinion about why crosswords were so popular. It absorbs our minds, drugs our senses, brings the peace and forgetfulness we crave, and at the same time, we can kid ourselves that it increases our vocabularies and improves our minds. Not that it really does these things. One man was quoted in the New York Times as saying early on in the craze, 
Crossword puzzles have gripped the American people until it seems as though half our population is busily engaged in working out their solutions. Wherever we go, we see a puzzle. Folks traveling back and forth on the trains find it a source of great pleasure. In the first issue of The New Yorker, February 1925, it was observed that many people were doing them on subways and L trains in the city. This portability undoubtedly contributed to their success, and it was also a time-consuming indoor activity during the winter. The craze also caused sales for dictionaries and thesauruses to soar. One company even made a tiny dictionary that could be worn on the wrist for easy access when doing crosswords. In Chicago, the influx of crossword puzzlers using the reading rooms in one public library had caused a severe shortage of dictionaries, and the library had to stock up on extra copies, and had to put a special clerk in charge of the dictionary shelves. Crosswords appeared all over satirical magazines, but they weren't necessarily criticizing them so much as showing how crazy some people were about them, and such people were called crossword fiends. General interest magazines also featured short reports on the different ways crosswords were being utilized. In the January 22, 1925 issue of Life magazine, there was this amusing little blurb. Professor Griffith of Mount Holyoke College has declared that the students should be asked to make up crosswords at the end of each semester, using the new words they have learned during the year. The freshman class will begin with petting, 4 a.m., hooch, cubs, paddle, smooth this, step on it, give me a light, and necking party. A funny fake report, again from Life magazine, poked fun at how widespread the crossword fad had become by Christmas time 1924. It is rumored that there is a woman in Farmington, Connecticut, who has never done a crossword puzzle or expressed any curiosity about the process. But at the time of going to press, the report has not been confirmed. I think my favorite of the cultural references to crosswords that I came across was a comic by Rube Goldberg. Yes, that Rube Goldberg. It shows a man doing a crossword with a woman and a police officer in the room with him. The woman is pleading with the officer not to arrest the man. She tells him, Officer, don't arrest him. He's not really a bum at heart. The caption for the first panel reads, Just like booze, it's landing them in the gutter. In the next panel, the man's daughter pleads with him to go home with her, but he's too focused to pay attention. The caption says, The crossword puzzle addict has taken the place of the old barroom loafer. The next panel's caption says, Too much for a young wife to bear. The wife cries to her mother. Mother, I can't stand it any longer. Joe is off on another of his crossword puzzle sprees. And her mother exclaims, The brute. The last panel's caption says, They'll simply have to stop it and put it on the same basis as liquor. It shows the crossword-addicted man whispering to another man, I've got some pre-war crossword puzzles I'll absolutely guarantee to be the real stuff. There was also a one-panel comic template that had a commonly used setup for a joke involving crosswords. When someone asks, What's a four-letter word meaning something something something? I saw it a lot in the course of the research for this video, so here's a random example of that. A man asks his wife, Dear, what is a seven-letter word meaning I'll never look at another woman? And the wife responds, Baloney. But, of course, there were detractors who didn't like the crossword craze, and some of them didn't seem to have much of a sense of humor about it. On November 17, 1924, the New York Times published an editorial slamming crosswords. It said, Latest of the problems presented for solution by psychologists interested in the mental peculiarities of mobs and crowds as distinguished from individuals is created by what is well called the craze over crossword puzzles. This is not a game at all, and it hardly can be called a sport. It merely is a new utilization of leisure by those for whom it otherwise would be empty and tedious. They get nothing out of it except a primitive sort of mental exercise, and success or failure in any given attempt is equally irrelevant to mental development. 
Ironically, the New York Times would later become famous for crosswords, but they wouldn't actually publish any until 1942. And in the 1920s, it, along with others, was very dismissive of them. And can you guess who was the first crossword puzzle editor for the New York Times? That's right, Margaret Petherbridge. Though by that time she had married and had become Margaret Farrar. Knowing its stance on crosswords in the 1920s, it might be difficult to tell if the New York Times was joking when, on December 14th, 1924, it said, Typhoid has made its appearance in the better residential districts, and may possibly be traced to lower vitality resulting from excessive indulgence in crossword puzzles. People found many uses for crosswords. For example, charity or fundraising events, teaching English, advertising, novels, and even clothing. Yes, clothing. It's weird things like this that prove it was actually a craze. I found articles describing crossword stockings as well as a $10 crossword print dress. Even Macy's in New York City offered a crossword puzzle pattern dress. And I also found crossword hats, neckties, vanity boxes, and bracelets. The influence of crosswords on fashion was addressed in a short article, and someone in the garment industry said, It is causing a greater demand for checked patterns of all sizes and plaids. In the last few weeks, the manufacturers and retailers have realized the importance of the development, and the former are not slow in taking advantage of this feature entering into the spring situation. Silks, as well as woolens and worsteds, are being developed in the patterns resembling the crossword brain teasers. There was even an actual Broadway play called Puzzles of 1925. At the end of this play, there was a crossword sanitarium that seemed to be one of the most memorable parts of the show. And if you ask me, I think it's about time for a revival. By the start of 1925, crosswords had gone completely mainstream, making appearances in all kinds of media. For example, the 1925 Harold Lloyd comedy, The Freshman, uses crosswords for a funny gag. And the always up-to-date Felix the Cat appeared in a short that centered on crosswords to make some culturally relevant jokes. They also seeped into songs. One was titled, Crossword Mama, You Puzzle Me, But Papa's Gonna Figure You Out. And another was less cleverly titled, Crossword Puzzle Blues. There was also a crossword novel called The Long Green Gaze by Vincent Fuller, which got quite a good deal of advertising due to its novelty. The Chicago Tribune reported on the White Sox baseball team getting in on the fad in an article from March 17, 1925. It rained today in the camp of the White Sox, and there was nary a card game. But inside of ten minutes, the greater part of Mr. Eddie Collins' squad was busy with pencils working out crossword puzzles. That has become the chief form of diversion for the athletes when they are not engaged in diamond drill. Mr. Collins himself is one of them. Some of the boys have become quite proficient. All the little pocket dictionaries in town have been purchased. The Amateur Crossword League of America made the national news during their tournament season. And a mere six weeks after the original Simon & Schuster crossword book was published, the Crossword Puzzle Association of America was formed in New York. And this event held a contest where a man solved an entire standard crossword in 10 minutes and 10 seconds. And this man, William A. Stern II, also wrote the preface for the second series of the Simon & Schuster crossword book. Being a crossword fiend could also have given you a chance at a good chunk of money. In New York, newspapers offered big cash prizes and crossword contests. The New York Graphic offered $25,000 in prizes, and the New York Mirror upped the ante and offered $30,000. And keep in mind that those numbers are not adjusted for inflation. On the radio, you could listen in on crossword talks. I'm not entirely sure what those were, but I found them listed multiple times in radio schedules in the New York Times. Something else that really surprised me was how crosswords and the fads surrounding them somehow seeped into serious news reports. For example, in an article about Yugoslavia on December 14, 1924, it was written that, 
The whereabouts of Croatian leader Stefan Radic seem to occupy the Yugoslav public about as much as crossword puzzles do the people of the United States. And here's another example from two weeks earlier. Where the London gold shipments are going is one of the street's interesting crossword puzzles. As that last example demonstrates, crossword puzzle could also mean a perplexing and or convoluted situation, and it kept coming up during the research for this video. It's another little detail about the crossword craze that doesn't ever seem to come up in articles about it. Here's another example of the, I guess, slang usage of crossword puzzles that was in the Chicago Tribune. The majority of Mayor Devers' opponents in his plans to untangle a crossword puzzle of transportation problems consists of a bunch of disgruntled politicians. I really loved finding the occasional weird news story that blames something or other on crosswords or involved them in some way. And like the criticisms about crosswords, these stories never would have been published if there hadn't been a craze going on. I didn't check every single newspaper, of course, but I found quite a few gems that I really want to share. So here's the first one. Under the headline, Crossword Featured in Church, the article read, Crossword puzzle fans tonight flocked to the Knoxville Baptist Church in Orchard Place, where Reverend George F. McElvin, before beginning his sermon, let his congregation solve one of the familiar spaced squares which concealed the text. The puzzle, containing 144 spaces, was laid out on a blackboard at the front of the auditorium, printed copies of the definitions were distributed in the pews, and the congregation was invited to fill in the spaces. Fifteen minutes was allowed for solution. All the needed words were called out from the pews within the time set. It was then pointed out that the completed puzzle contained the words from Proverbs 1.10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. In that very same issue on December 1st, 1924, there was a blurb about a man who had been obstructing traffic in a restaurant because he was solving a crossword. He stayed there with a few friends for three hours until 1.40 a.m. The manager of the restaurant told the men they would have to make way for other customers to sit down. When he was ignored, the manager called the police. A police officer told the men they would have to find another place to finish the crossword, but they ignored the police officer too. The manager then demanded that the men be arrested. The three friends evidently paid a $5 fine and moved on, but the remaining man chose to spend a day in jail in order to finish the puzzle. Less than two weeks after those last two articles, there was another one telling of how a husband became so obsessed with crosswords that his wife was considering a divorce. It also said that a legal aid organization claimed it got 10 letters a day from wives who were sick of staying home every evening due to their husband's crossword puzzleitis. About a month after that, there was a humorous incident at a traffic court. The magistrate of the court saw 25 people, all claimants, at the table before him, but none of them were paying attention. What are they doing? He demanded. A court attendant replied, solving crossword puzzles. The attendant himself had also just been engaged with his own crossword. Tell them to stop at once, the magistrate said. One of the claimants also admitted that it was partly due to crosswords that he had missed his last court date to pay a fine. Variety reported that a French horn player in a Broadway theater put a crossword puzzle over his sheet music, but switched the two papers when his leader looked over. The bad performance was noticed, though many audience members apparently thought he was supposed to be playing badly for comedic effect. In Los Angeles, a man was working on a crossword and trying to think of a six-letter word meaning mousetrap. Another man he was working with thought up Tomcat. For some reason, the first man was not content with this answer, and allegedly hit the second man in the head with an iron bookend. But the men reconciled and began working on more crosswords together. In Jacksonville, Florida, the district attorney blamed a crossword puzzle for him being two hours late for a speech. He was quoted as saying, I don't know how it happened. I boarded a train at Springfield for Jacksonville and got off at Griggsville, 30 miles west of Jacksonville, and had to drive back. I only remember picking up a crossword puzzle. 
And in mid-December 1925, after the peak of the craze had died down, a man in Brooklyn murdered his wife because she wouldn't help him solve a crossword puzzle. Apparently, the man had been driven mad by them. Although, I'm very sure there were underlying issues that contributed more to this tragedy than just simply crossword puzzles. And that wasn't the only case of crossword-induced madness. In Los Angeles in late January 1925, a man was found sitting on a curb downtown, unable to remember his name or personal information. He was taken to a hospital, and when he was searched, a thesaurus and a lot of crossword puzzles were found in his pocket. The physician's diagnosis was quoted as being, and I'm not joking, an advanced case of amnesia brought on by excessive addiction to crossword puzzles. As might be expected, there was a big debate about whether crosswords were good or bad. Debates like these pretty much always seem ridiculous to us today. I mean, does anyone actually think crosswords pose any serious threat? There were some small legitimate concerns like eye strain, but again, if crosswords hadn't been so popular, these reports almost certainly wouldn't have made the news due to lack of interest. There was also a fairly academic debate about whether or not crosswords actually stimulated people. A New York Times editorial referenced a skeptical article in The New Republic when it wrote, The New Republic says that for a writer or speaker, no exercise possibly could be worse than working on these puzzles, for the reason that it tends to fix false definitions in the mind, and to loss of appreciation of the differences between words, which, though related, are by no means synonymous. Skill and art, for instance, are by no means interchangeable. But I would argue if people weren't mindlessly doing crosswords, then they would be mindlessly doing something else. While I, like I'm sure many of you, disagree with the arguments about crosswords being harmful, I can definitely see how it might have been annoying that some people went around thinking they were geniuses because they could solve crossword puzzles. Now let's move across the pond to Britain, where the craze had spread by the end of 1924. Allegedly, even Queen Mary and Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin were fans. Punch, a satirical British magazine, commented on the craze spreading to its shores by saying, We are asked to announce that the Ministry of Health has, after careful consideration, decided not to make the crossword craze a notifiable disease. In fact, Punch is an excellent source for quips, references, and one-liners about the crossword craze, and I can't resist going through a couple more of them here. Here's another one. Sir Arthur Keith says that man's brain is becoming smaller as the centuries give him fewer problems to tackle. Hatters, however, are not going to stock any at six and a half until the crossword craze has subsided. There was also a witty quip about politics involving crosswords. Mr. Lloyd George at Coventry complained that he was a martyr to crosswinds. Crosswind puzzles, of course, are all the rage in parliamentary circles just now. Commenting on the zealousness of some crossword fiends, Punch quipped, An American doctor declares that crossword puzzles have resulted in uniting many families. It must be nice when they all meet together in the same padded room. Using the frequency of references to crossword puzzles in magazines and newspapers as a vague metric, the craze was at fever pitch from around November 1924 to around March 1925. One editorial from March 10th said that, The craze is evidently dying out fast, and in a few months it will have been forgotten. About a week later, there was a response editorial denying that the craze was dying down, but mentions of crosswords declined significantly in the news shortly after that initial prediction was made. It was over. But I'm just talking about the craze phase, because crosswords have continued to exist until the modern day, of course. It might be strange to think that something so mundane as a kind of puzzle could have caused such a strong reaction, but it's just one of those things that makes the 1920s such a fascinating time. After diving more deeply into the crossword craze, I knew I had to get some kind of memento. At first, I wanted to get one of the original Simon & Schuster books, but I could only find one copy of the second series, and yeah, it was $1,200. I didn't want to spend that much money and you can find the first three series for free on the Internet Archive anyway. 
But do you remember that I mentioned before that there was a crossword novel called The Long Green Gaze? Well, I was able to track down an original copy of that for the modest price of $30. So, taking a quick look at that, there are some crossword puzzles throughout the book that should be completed in order to continue on with the story. The book isn't very dense, but that's kind of what I expected. I saw some reviews from the 1920s saying that the actual story wasn't anything special, and it was just the novelty of crosswords that made it noteworthy. And that's not surprising either. Novelties are rarely intended or expected to be long-lasting. In my copy, the puzzles are already completed. Maybe for most collectors, this would be a bad thing, but I actually think it's cooler if this book was owned and used by an original crossword fiend, because it's a more personal connection with history in my opinion. The book was apparently a gift to the original owner, and it's addressed to Paul from 1925. So, thanks for the book, Aunt Edna. I hope Paul enjoyed doing these crosswords. Because The Long Green Gaze is a rather obscure book, and the copyright has definitely expired by now if it hadn't already long ago, at some point I want to do a full read-through across multiple videos. I'd have the crosswords edited to be blank again, so you guys can either try and solve them by yourself or work together in the comments. Then, after it's all finished, I can make a full, all-in-one video version. So, this kind of interactive video would be a little experiment. It'll be a while before I can do that though, because it's at my parents' house now. But I just wanted to throw that idea out there. So, let me know what you think. It's been a while since researching for a video was this fun. Like I said at the beginning, this was originally supposed to be a short video that kind of spiraled out of control into a very long one but I'm really happy that it did because I got to learn a lot. At some point, I'll probably do a read-through of a lot of the short articles I found about crosswords and put them in a separate video. So, were you like me and surprised at how intense the crossword puzzle craze was? I'd heard of it before, but it was much more pervasive and crazier than I'd realized. But I guess that's why they call it a craze. Well, anyway, that's all for now, all you sheiks and gals out there, but stay tuned for more Tales from the Jazz Age. The way you talk these days, I have to guess your ways. You're like the crossword craze, crossword mama, you puzzle me, the mama's gonna figure you out.